For those of you who are not familiar with the UCLA architecture and urban design, we call it AUD. We are the, let's say, leading player on the international stage of a contemporary architecture, from established leaders in the field to today's emerging uh, voices. We have a faculty that is committed to advancing design as mean to transform society and renew culture. So we are deeply immersed in a research environment that anticipates changes and moves from a realm of ideas to their application from present situation to the future. This gaze to the future informed the concept behind our public program series, Extreme Ideas, architecture at the intersection of which this panel is the first. When invited to participate in a Pacific Standard Time present modern architecture in LA, we knew that the uh, strongest contribution that AUD could add was to carry the narrative of modern architecture from its influential past to the future. Against the background of the history of um, Los Angeles architecture, which is being excellently described in the series of exhibitions and program of modern architecture initiative, we wanted to look beyond the field of traditional boundaries and explore topics arising from rapidly emerging new technologies and the growing interdisciplinary collaborations, ideas that are fundamental to our program. Core to the concept of extreme ideas program series are the questions. What comes next? What are the new boundaries of the field? How do rapidly emerging new technology affect form and function? What are the new possibilities for interdisciplinary interaction? What role will Los Angeles play in the evolution of the architecture? What are the vision of future? Tonight's conversation, Extreme Intelligence, the future of thinking environment is one of three conversations that were conceived as whole. We urge to you attend all three, actually, if you could, with a similar thread connecting the three events to create the conversation about the future. Three panels, extreme intelligence, extreme culture, and extreme environment are the certainly not the only lens through uh, which to view the future, but they do represent the conversation in which architecture plays a central role in a nexus of interdisciplinary discourse, invention, and work. And these three topics are issues which we explore deeply at AUD. We organize three extreme ideas uh, conversations at three venues of the UCLA campus. Actually, this is a very difficult place to find a parking. In order to keep our focus on Los Angeles City, that has been a long-term laboratory to continually emerge in and nurture new visions for our future. What better place than here in a creative artist agency building to explore the idea of thinking environment? Here in Century City with such a strong ties to film, television and music industry, all industries that are reinventing boundaries of experience and information. Our next panel on Wednesday, May 29th is located in West Adams, one of the oldest neighborhood in Los Angeles at the UCLA Clark Memorial Library, one of UCLA's major library for the rare books and manuscripts and fittings. Uh, and fittingly, the topics for the panel is extreme culture. The third panel on Wednesday, June 5th, is at the Leonel Nimoy Event Horizon at the Griffiths Observatory, a venue that without further exp explanation needed is a very fitting location for our conversation about extreme environment. Finally, I, I want to especially invite you all to fourth event in the Extreme Idea series on June 28th at yet another historic Los Angeles venue. Runway 
is a celebration to mark the culmination of the Pacific Standard Time Presents Initiatives, LA Architecture Month. We have invited noted architects, designers, and thinkers to share their thought on the future throughout the series of fast-paced back-to-back presentations. The event will take place at our department's new satellite facility, Ideas, at the Hercules campus in Playa Vista, where Howard Hughes built the Spruce Goose aircraft in the 1940s. Runway will be the sneak peek of Ideas, which officially launched, launches in August of this year to house our newly expanded Super Studio program. This groundbreaking program will have studios led by Frank Gehry, Greg Lean, and Tom Main, some of the biggest luminaries of our field, and will have a strong emphasis on cross-discipline research and development to expand the future boundaries of our field. So tonight's panel is a first event in a very exciting journey into the future that we can all take together. The Extreme Ideas series owes many thanks, first and foremost, to the Getty Foundation. Thank you for your major support, leadership, and inspiration. I also want to thank and acknowledge tonight's host, Creative Artist Agency, and to Tao Nguyen for her support of this event. Unfortunately, she is not here. I think she is enjoying her vacation in Bola Bola. <laughs> and of course, thank you to the art community here. Our graduated gratitude goes also to Chris Hostetter of Toyota and Jason Hatakeyama of Boeing. Uh, for additional sponsor, of, I mean, they are the additional sponsor of the Extreme Ideas program series. Uh, thanks as well to Kathleen Johnson, the project manager of Pacific Standard Time Present, Modern Architecture in LA. Another groundbreaking uh, collaboration for our city. I don't know where you are, but thank you very much. To the AUD faculty and staff, many thanks. Program like this one require a team, and you are a great team to whom I much actually adapted. So tonight's conversation is led by uh, our faculty, Neil Dinari, who will introduce the member of this conversation, which looks at the future of intelligent environments. Before I invite Neil to the stage, I want to say a few words about him. Neil Dinari is a principal of NMDA, Neil M. Dinari Architects, Inc., and professor of architecture at UCLA. He received his Bachelor of Architecture from University of Houston in 1980 and the Master of Architecture from Harvard in 1982. After graduate school, Dinari intended at Eos Patile, sorry but for bad pronunciation, which is now Airbus in Paris and lived and worked in New York until he moved permanently to Los Angeles in 80, 1988 when he funded NMDA. Among his many awards are the Los Angeles AIA gold medal given in 2011 his induction into the Interior Design Hall of Fame in 2010, the California Community Foundation Fellowship from the United States Artists Organization in 2009, and Architecture Award from American Academy of Arts and Letters, which he received in 2008. With NMDA, he has produced many award-winning projects across North America, Asia, Europe, and among them are HL23, a 14-story condominium tower on the High Line in New York, completed in 2012, and New Keelan Harbor cruise ship terminal in Taiwan. It's a, wow, one million square foot complex, which will begin construction next year. Dinali lectures and exhibit worldwide and has been visiting professors at Harvard, Princeton, Columbia, and UC Berkeley, among other schools, and was a director of SIAC from 1997 to 2002. He's author of Interrupted 
uh, projections and gyroscopic uh, horizons and uh, facticity forthcoming in 2014. So please welcome Neil Dinari. So thanks for coming. You know, if you see a poster or an ad or something for a topic called extreme intelligence, you're going to come, right? I mean, it's like a, the new reality show, the new world of uh, life as we're kind of living it right now. Um, I've got two incredibly, extremely intelligent panelists to, to chat with tonight, and it's going to be fun. And before I introduce uh, Joe and Greg, I want to show a few images to kind of uh, get the provocation going. This is a talk about uh, cities, and we're uh, obviously in the throes of uh, urban uh, intensification all the time. Very soon, 80% of the world's population will live in a city, so it's a little bit uh, 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 challenging to kind of leave out the other 20% of, of, our, of our esteemed uh, global population, but tonight we're going to talk about living in cities and what that means for uh, life. You know, you see an image like this of uh, Hong Kong, uh, one of the great neon tiger cities. And in many ways, if you've been to Hong Kong, you know that life during the day and life on the ground is a little bit different than what you see here. And cities come in all shapes and sizes. We're in downtown Century City. Uh, it was uh, somehow built new, like all other new towns, like Brasilia and so forth. And here we are. Uh, how it relates to L.A. is always an ongoing sort of question, but cities come in instant form, they come in organic forms, they come in neon forms, etc. They come in these types of forms. Do you know where this is? Kabul, uh, up against the mountains, uh, extreme environment if there ever was one, and we know the kind of political conditions of what's going on there now and what the world is as a physical environment, completely different, of course, than what we know in Tokyo. New York, we all have on the panel tonight, we all have a relationship to the city. Uh, um, uh, we, uh, Greg currently lives there, I live there, and Joe did it as well. Uh, is it the center of the universe? <laughs> no. <laughs> Good answer. No, we all have interesting relationships to New York. It's a benchmark for urbanism of one kind or another, and if I showed you a picture of L.A. and New York back to back, which describes in a way the issues and the challenges of what sustainability are about because many issues, uh, circulation and transportation are what define cities. The Casbah in Algiers, an old, compact, dense world, a labyrinth, you wonder, is the cell reception good in there? Is it, is it really, you know, a place that you can sort of navigate in today's world? But it's undeniably a type of city that we know and, of course, Venice, uh, uh, the great, uh, in many ways, artificial city, uh, but becoming a, a world city at the same time because of its incredible uniqueness. And Venice, we have, again, as, a, <laughs> as an artificial uh, world made of uh, certain types of elements. And so the idea of cities being able to reproduce themselves, uh, ideas about what they uh, are in terms of human environment and how we can graph them from one to the next, are now playing out, obviously, in digital uh, terms as well. Take Amsterdam. You've been there, I'm sure. You can walk across the city in about an hour, um, not even on a bicycle. Uh, here it is, a radial city, you know, the, the city of uh, polders and dealing with uh, the issue of infrastructure and water. And, and, of course, this is really what life is like in, in in Amsterdam, you're riding a bicycle, and here's this incredible density. This looks like a, some strange art project uh, to us in Los Angeles, uh, a, a world that we really don't know about. Here's our city, the city that's not concentric. It's obviously open-ended. It goes everywhere, all the time, in every direction. In many ways, we'd say it's formless. Uh, we'd say it's maybe just the pure infrastructure uh, of the grid. And when we do get form, this is what it is. Now, we're going to be talking a little bit tonight about the relationship, obviously, between um, technology in terms of lifestyle 
technology in terms of moving bodies in space. In this case, this is our, our lingua franca, obviously, of, of Los Angeles. And in many ways, so much of the world, um, this uh, image could also be outside Bangkok, one of the biggest cities in the world that doesn't have uh, a subway. And uh, to, to, to our minds here in Los Angeles, this is both the, uh, the, the, the love and the bane of, of our existence here in a way. And we'll get into, I think, that in a bit of a freewheeling discussion. This is an image of Sim City. You see the airplane. You see uh, buildings copied from various cities. I think some projects like the gas tower uh, in, in LA you see there. And of course, in your bedroom, you can construct these cities and uh, compete, play games, be land barons, be Robert Moses, cut freeways, uh, uh, develop towers, et cetera, et cetera. And they're also building these uh, in places uh, outside of uh, Incheon Airport in Korea, which Greg mentions uh, at the beginning of his book. So architecture, money, uh, power, circulation, uh, fiction, fact, these are all things that, of course, involve the nature of the construction uh, of cities. This is uh, that city. It's got a nice river running through it. Um, it's uh, probably not as beautiful as that uh, river in uh, Paris, but you can also see the will in especially the production of instant cities, which of course would be cities based on high technology, smoothness, pure infrastructure, that there's also a longing and a, and a lingering uh, a feeling for the nature of environment that had nothing to do with its form uh, formation vis-a-vis -vis digital technology. And of course, as we loop back to images like of the neon tiger image of uh, Hong Kong, we see fact and fiction being played out in, in uh, uh, images in cinema, in uh, illustration and so forth, where the pure reality of light and sun are playing out against a kind of uh, digital uh, impression of what life is like. And it's interesting, we will talk about futurism as a kind of ongoing theme as an ongoing issue, the temptation to be prognosticators, the temptation to predict, uh, scenario planners, um, thinking about the future, whether it's one year, five years, 10 years down the line. Here's Frank Gehry's uh, Beekman Tower. Uh, it's already uh, being co-opted by uh, some other sort of uh, life. And in many ways, um, it looks perfect in terms of that uh, particular condition. Now, cities are physical things. They're not built by one person, one mayor, one patriarch. They're organic things. They're big, they're problematic. You really can't control cities. And yet, when we think about designers trying to uh, develop infrastructure and so forth, the idea is to leverage more and more control. Cities may push back on the nature of control you guys are enjoying it, aren't you? Good. Uh, smart cities, digital cities, where infrastructure is uh, now immaterial, and all those cities are what they are, and they have uh, uh, their form and their life. The idea of how we navigate them, obviously, is changing, and I think that's part of what extreme intelligence is, is about. Who's got the technology? Who's got access to it? Does it cost anything? Is it free? What's the social condition of it? The driverless car, let's say, uh, is one particular uh, thought that I'm sure you've all had in uh, thinking about the future of Los Angeles. Is it possible for you to be sleeping while you're commuting to work? Could you give up that much control? I think this guy is actually going, how do I work this? Uh, <laughs> and you know the Google Glass and what it can do, but you also know that there are issues of uh, what can you really see and who owns a particular type of public space. So there's political issues, of course, with the nature of technology. We've known that with um, bio uh, uh, technology, with cloning and so forth, which can reproduce human cells and tissue, uh, but which also can get into issues of, of uh, incredible humanitarian uh, questions. 
So if you're wearing the glass, maybe the city looks more like this, even in a small piazza in, in a European city can turn into some sort of uh, art interactive uh, information um, surface. So the relationship between what architecture does as an intelligent device, call it a machine, and uh, our bodies, which are becoming more and more extended through technology, I think tonight we're not going to talk about gadgets as much as we're going to talk about what it, what it means, what it possibly could mean for everyday life. And it might mean uh, political uh, uh, changes, it might mean social uh, changes, et cetera. Here's the fiction to fact uh, reality timeline, what happened when and you know, what really was implemented. There's uh, uh, Mr. Spock, no, that's uh, Captain Kirk with the thingy and uh, the RoboCop and all sorts of other things and drone helicopters and some of it came true and some of it didn't. And thinking about that idea of speculating is I think going on in, in our panelists' work tonight. So I'm going to introduce uh, Joe and, and Greg, um, and then we're going to get to it. Uh, we're going to leave enough time for questions from the audience, so please start formulating them now. I'm a professor, and I always like to have good questions, so I challenge you uh, to do that. So Joe, Joseph Kaczynski is a director whose uncompromising visual style and dynamic approach to filmmaking craft has quickly made a mark on the cultural zeitgeist. His feature film debut, Tron Legacy, which was for uh, Disney Studios, grossed over $400 million uh, worldwide and was nominated for several awards, including an Academy Award and a Grammy for an incredible uh, score. Uh, Oblivion, um, this is the Sky House uh, from that film. Oblivion, which is, uh, stars Tom Cruise and, and Morgan Freeman, it's out in the theaters now. It's based on his graphic novel of the same name. He worked on it for, for many, many years. It's, a, it's an adventure. It's set 60 years in the future after the Earth has been attacked by aliens. The audience is told at the beginning, we won the war, but they destroyed half the planet. The film's dystopic landscapes um, echo this tone. And in Kenneth Turin's LA Times review of the film, he notes Kaczynski has an architectural background, and it shows in the sleekly futuristic look of the uh, that the film gives to both the highly mobile bubble ship, a combination jet plane and helicopter that looks like a flying can opener, and that's Kenneth Turin's uh, term, and the Sky Tower, a coolly minimalistic residential structure set 3,000 feet uh, above the surface of the earth. And if you haven't seen the film, please go out and see it. It's, it's uh, a phenomenal experience. Uh, Joseph received his undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering at Stanford University. That's extreme intelligence right there. Uh, before graduating from Columbia University with a master's degree in architecture uh, during the Bernard Chumi um, years. His diverse background in architecture, design, and music has informed his film and commercial work. Early in his career, he gained recognition for his advanced CGI work in television commercial uh, work on Starry Night for Halo 3, and the award-winning Mad World commercial for Gears of War. Here's some other images. Yeah, you recognize the East Coast. And the Tet. Brilliant. That's Tom Cruise contemplating. Great. Greg Lindsay is a journalist, urbanist, and speaker. He's a contributing writer for Fast Company and author of the international bestseller, Aerotropolis, The Way We'll Live Next. He's a visiting scholar at New York University's Rudin Center for Transportation Policy and Management, a fellow of the World Policy Institute, and an affiliate researcher of the New England Complex Systems Institute. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, Business Week, the Financial Times, McKinsey Quarterly, World Policy Journal, Marie Claire Italia, Travel and Leisure, Condé Nast Traveler and Departures. He was previously a contributing writer for Fortune and an editor-at-large for Advertising Age. 
Greg speaks frequently about globalization, innovation, and the future of cities, most recently at the London School of Economics, the Institute for the Future, Intel Labs, Museum of Modern Art, the World Policy Institute, the Asia Society, and Columbia University. His work with Studio Gang, uh, based in Chicago, uh, Architects on the Future of Suburbia, was on display at MoMA from February through August of last year. He's currently working with UCLA City Lab to reimagine the economy and urbanism of the Ecuadorian Amazon. He's been cited as an expert on the future of travel, technology, and urbanism, which is why he's here tonight, by the New York Times, Washington Post, USA Today, and Congressional uh, Quarterly. And he's advised Intel, Audi, FedEx, Teague, Andre Balage, and clients of Wolf Olams and Fathom and Hatch. He graduated from the University of Illinois with a degree in journalism, and he's a two-time champion of Jeopardy. And the only human right here, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> to go undefeated against IBM Watson. So I think we've got some serious intelligence up here. That's, that's I'm just going to try and hang out and hold my own and see if I can not get booed off. But thank you very much. Great. So, you know, we've been uh, chatting about uh, kind of how to launch this conversation. And I think the question about intelligence, the idea that on the one hand, native intelligence, you know, when you think somebody's smart, and intelligence has to do with uh, how your brain and synapses work. Yet today, in this kind of growing sense of extreme intelligence, it has to do with uh, how uh, ambitious you are to learn, in a way, and to gain information. Everybody's like a little CIA agent in themselves, thinking about how I can um, navigate how I can make things work better, smoother, how I can kind of extend what I do with whatever attribute I'm interested in, more, greater, faster, quicker. So I wanted to kind of talk about this, this idea of what, is it, what does it mean to have intelligence today in a kind of a broad uh, sense? I'll, I'll kick it off, I guess. Um, I, think, I think you make a good point, I mean, the the tools that are available us, to us today are, you know, even 10 years ago would have been, seemed like science fiction. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, I think to be intelligent today is to know how to use them uh, in the best way possible. Um, you know, for me, I would say, you know, intelligence is figuring out how to get from my house here as quickly as possible by having, you know, checking Google Maps, figuring out which route will, will get me here in the shortest amount of time, mm -hmm. um, being able to, you know, make a couple phone calls on the way. Uh, if I get stopped at a red light long enough to check a couple emails, maybe message someone back. Um, if I'm uh, stuck in an airport for 15 minutes, I can pull up uh, this mobile app I have called Pix, which allows me to look at cuts of the movie, to look at visual effects shots, to give notes, to give feedback. Um, it's about, for me, I think it's about being as productive and as efficient with your time as possible so that at the end of the day, you have time to turn everything off and spend time with my son, um, which, you know, the more intelligent I am during the day, the more time I'll have to kind of do the really important things uh, at home. So for me, I think it's it's about learning how to be facile with the tremendous amount of information that we have available to us. Yeah, I mean, the, the first thought when I think of that comes to mind is, um, is you know, Alvin Toffler's famous quote from Future Shock, which is 43 years old, you know, the, the illiterate of the future won't be those who cannot read, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn, a great quote which still surfaces. And to me, it's interesting because even in 1970, you know, you had the planned obsolescence of knowledge, you know, and, and, uh, and intelligence. Um, you would have to purge it systematically uh, and then relearn. Um, I, I, you know, I, I guess I would echo what, what, what Joe said in that. I mean, to me, intelligence is a notion of, of 
and you know, it's funny seeing it through this prism that we have of, you know, of, of productivity and economic value and all this sort of stuff. But it's a notion of, uh, you know, intelligence is knowing what you need, is this meta knowledge of knowing what you need to know and knowing what you can outsource into increasingly, you know, the computer and hive mind in our pockets uh, and the crowd and everything else. And so it becomes a question for all of us, you know, what, what, what intelligence do I need to keep in my skull um, that makes me, I guess on one level who I am philosophically and, and also one level that makes me valuable, that makes me, you know, makes me productive, that makes me able to earn a living um, versus, you know, what, what can be outsourced. And so we've already made the decision, you know, mapping is not something we want. I mean, God, my experiences in LA from New York are just so much more pleasurable now that I have the Google Maps voice ringing in my head and I don't even have Waze. So I'm actually behind the curve on this one, uh, at least until Facebook buys it and ruins it. Um, and so, you know, we've already made the decision that we're going to outsource maps, we're going to outsource our photo albums to the cloud, we're going to outsource, you know, huge chunks uh, of our actual memory into that. And the question ultimately becomes, you know, what, what do we preserve? Um, and then on top of that, you know, intelligence to me is, is actually knowing um, how all that is structured, you know, knowing uh, where your data lies, knowing who has access to it and, and how it's being used. And I think that's one of the themes we're going to get into tonight is, um, is exactly, you know, who has that intelligence, intel, and truly in that sense, in the sense of, um, you know, political intel, military intel, uh, intel that's valuable. You know, I think one of the tensions we're going to maybe explore tonight is, um, let's say, the tensions between an anecdote of you and your tools and what they can do for you, your relationship to other people who have them, and to the idea that, on the one hand, space as we know it, which is now absolutely collapsed, um, whether it has been for 50, 60 years with air travel um, to get our bodies in, 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 into, in, in, into places, you know, relatively quickly still, versus, uh, you know, the quicksilver nature of, of digital technology, which may or may not um, allow the, the pathway to get here to be smooth, um, because there are forces out there that are bigger than us. But if I put something on the table like, uh, you know, we're here uh, as part of UCLA. There's a campus. It's very beautiful. It's green. We love going there every day. And, you know, one of the things that we've resisted, you know, to a certain extent at the school is distance learning. And here we're actually talking about, you should just give me everything that I need to know, you know, from a distance. And yet at the same time, there's a project that's still, you know, about collectivity. And in the case of studying architecture, you know, it's about being in a, in a, in a, in a space together to kind of you know, work and operate and actually share and maybe even have debates about, you know, what does a drawing uh, uh, mean versus, uh, uh, you know, an image that can be produced, you know, someplace else. So what do you feel, uh, especially when I think about this idea of, of intelligence as it's being played out vis-a-vis -vis, uh, learning and, you know, education and so forth, do you have any, do you have any thoughts about that I know it's not about going back to college, so to speak, because we're all adults and we're we're working in a kind of a contemporary language of instantaneousness. But th this tension is what I want to explore between public space and be between private space, between collective environments, you know, and singular environments, uh, um, and how technology aid and abets and challenges, you know, new new social conditions. I guess. Thank you. Um, I mean, I mean the. Your question gets back to the root of why in the age of perfect telecommunications and increasing perfection, you know, we have telepresence now so you can do, you know, lifelike people across the screen. Why do cities still exist? Why do we still have dense agglomerations of people? I mean, this is after Marshall McLuhan declared the death of the city in 1970, they are museums. Uh, and George Gilder declared the death of cities in 1995 as relics of the industrial age. And yet, you know, now we have a whole raft of books. Uh, including mine and others, Ed Glazer declaring the triumph of the city, and this is mankind's greatest invention, and, and this is all thriving in the age of the internet. And I think that all comes back to, in the end, it all comes back to face-to-face -to -face encounters, that there is a, there's a degree of emotional intelligence, of personal intelligence, of actually the, how ideas are shared and transmitted between people that requires face-to-face -face contact. Um, and that, you know, so touching upon that, I'm very much opposed to MOOCs and, and the online education as it's being structured because I think what in the end you're going to have there is, is that, you know, uh, you're going to have an elite system. You're going to have, you know, the Ivy League Plus where what you really learn in those institutions and those places are the social capital, to borrow another bloodless phrase, uh, where, you know, where the people you meet are the people who are going to shape your fate forever. Those serendipitous encounters uh, in college and elsewhere. Uh, 
uh, that ultimately lead to the connections, the social networks, if you will, um, that will eventually lead to that. And if you have distance learning, you have none of that. You have none of that face-to-face. -face. You're simply getting this information. You're getting none of the context around it. Um, and so to get into the technology part of that, the stuff that I'm really interested in these days that I'm writing a lot about and, and spending time with um, is the notion of the serendipitous city in the age of the network. You know, I, I have a phrase I use, so you, I have a phrase that I use called engineering serendipity, um, which is an oxymoron on its face. And this is exactly what Google and others are trying to do. You saw the, the image that was up there for a while is of an app called Sonar, which is essentially taking the GPS in your phone, your social networks that you've logged in online, including Foursquare and LinkedIn and Facebook, uh, and scanning for people around you to see who's around, of, and particularly of like interest. And, uh, and the intelligence that I'd be curious to see eventually is going to be um, how much can we take from our online personas, the data exhaust that's around us, uh, and have algorithms learn from that. And so you can essentially, can essentially play introductions. It could match make you. Um, because I would hazard a guess that the most valuable portion of your evening tonight is not actually listening to me right now. It's you mingling earlier and then afterwards and the people you're going to meet here. Because this is why every networking event exists on this planet and why encounters like this matter is because of the people of like minds and interests who you'll meet here. And none of those encounters are knowable. And what we're seeing right now, Google and others, are trying to make that as visible and transparent and knowable as possible. Um, so I think that, in many ways, is a tension. How much of the actual raw frizzen and, and fission, well, not fission, I guess fusion of us together in the space uh, can be turned into ones and zeros and then fed through algorithms to do recommendations? I, that's the bleeding edge of what these various companies are doing. Joe, your, your oblivion, obviously, um treats uh, sort of, you know, the, the individual and, and the collective, you know, in, in very stark, strong ways. Um, how would you say your film sort of kind of talks about that? I, I mean, it, it really does talk about physical presence in many ways, despite the, the genre. Um, yeah, I mean, actually, I think both movies I've worked on do address the issues of our relationship with technology and the kind of positive side of it and the, and the negative. Um, uh, you know, as someone who uh, met the woman I eventually married the first day of college, you know, I'm certainly a proponent of the, you know, face-to-face. <laughs> -face. There's no replacement for a kind of face-to-face -face interaction, certainly with, That's a good you know, story. learning and, um, but also just the, the, the filmmaking process as well. You know, it's, for me, a lot of the creativity that happens that ends up on screen um, isn't, I mean, certainly do a lot of planning beforehand, you storyboard, you pre -vis, you do all that kind of work, but the true kind of magic happens when you've got that group of 30 or 40 people together that day, something happens that you could never predict. Um, so that, that I think will never be replaced. Um, but yeah, getting back to the movies, uh, uh, yeah, they, you know, both films, uh, I think, address that idea of, of, of how technology can, can service us and how it can be uh, uh, a detriment and kind of get in the way of, of what's really important. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I think that uh, it might lead a little bit into this kind of conversation about representation of, of technology and representation of the future. And... Much of what we're kind of talking about now, and by, by the way, this, this panel but is not about like trying to rec reclaim you know, humanity like it's all lost or something, and <laughs> we're all just a bunch of robots. It's, it's, it's obviously not that. I think it's establishing tension, you know, because there are still pockets or generations you know, who, who believe that technology is a kind of fatalistically problematic discourse. It's always been within the you know, philosophies of technology, whether it's about uh, the problems of uh, the earth and sustainability and, and the political affiliations with those sorts of things. But uh, the, the future is oftentimes unclear, especially in terms of uh, either scenarios or playing it out as being better or worse, or it'll be better but only if these things happen or it'll be worse if this trend you know, sort of continues. And it's always based on, on uh, in many ways, what your own personal ethos is uh, you know, about that. And w in, in your films, which are, which are obviously within a particular you know, uh, genre, they tell uh, specific stories. We know that you're supposed to go into the theater and, and you know, get into that world for, for two hours. But you also know that you know, when you leave the theater, you're going to 
step back into the blinding light of you know the day and so forth. And um, what do you what do you what do you what do you think about that in terms of uh, sending messages or trying to use the films as a as a medium to get people to think about their their world? Well, I'd say in film, the future is generally always worse. <laughs> um, for some reason, and I think that's because it's more believable. Be well, maybe believable. It's certainly more entertaining. Uh, it's certainly more dramatic when the future is full of problems that have to be solved by your protagonist. Uh -huh. um, uh, you know, usually there's a light at the end of the tunnel uh, at the end of the film, but generally um, the future is pretty bleak. Uh, and you know, I think this this summer alone we've got three or four post-apocalyptic movies coming out um, that, you know, Earth has been destroyed in each one in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. um, but for some reason, we're obsessed with that um, notion of, you know, destroying our, our own planet. And, and I know for me personally, just the idea for Oblivion kind of, I think, came out of a trip to Petra right after I graduated from architecture school and wandering through the canyons of this town that's, you know, in southern Jordan and was lost for centuries and mm -hmm. only discovered, I think, maybe 150 years ago by someone who snuck in, mm -hmm. um, a Westerner who snuck in. And, um, basically, it's a, it's a city carved in sandstone. Um, you might have seen it in Indiana Jones 3. Um, but uh, uh, I think that, that walking through those kind of empty canyons and seeing all these kind of uh, Holmes made me think about what's it going to be like when our, or will there, if, if there were a time where the, the cities and the world that we live in today is looked at by some future generation as, uh, you know, ruins, and they walk and look at our structures and, mm -hmm. you know, have the same kind of sense we do, like, boy, they really screwed up, but look what they did wrong, you know, luckily we've got it all figured out now, someone may be doing that on the future, and that was kind of this notion that I, I thought with Oblivion would be interesting to explore what would it be like to be the last man on earth and be picking through, um, you know, represented by the architecture, kind of icons of our time, pick through our civilization. Um, but uh, answering your question, I think, you know, you always want, you want, I always loved films where, you know, the, even if it is science fiction, there is something that we can relate to in our own lives. Um, and science fiction, I think, allows you to ask really profound questions that other genres can't ask, like, why are we here? What is it that makes us who we are? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I always love films that ask a couple questions that aren't answered and kind of leave it up to the viewer to walk out at the end of the film. And that's something I wanted to do with Oblivion, um, is, is have, make a movie where people walk out at the end and debate and talk about kind of some of the questions the movie poses. Um, but you hope that, uh, you hope that you can people find something to relate to in the film, regardless of of what the story is. You want you want to have something that people could kind of use to reflect on their own lives at the end mm -hmm. of the day. So, Greg, you know, in Aerotropolis, where uh, you know you identify in 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 the case of this uh, um, city in in Korea outside of Incheon, basically a you know a new city you know constructed from scratch and. And, uh, you know, we see cities in Asia primarily, maybe some in the Middle East, that almost sort of represent the future is now, and you can decide whether or not it's bleak in the present and, uh, or incredibly new and sort of vital. And, you know, building a city as a sort of a, an extension, you know, as a, like an appliance almost, a, a huge appliance right next to other appliances, airports and airplanes and everything is a kind of switching world and that these cities are built and sold off of um, smoothness, of, of um, digital access, um, everything that, that we'd like for the future, you know, to sort of be about. Um, the automatic, uh, the robotic, uh, the uh, easy, uh, the foolproof and so forth. Um, and it's interesting to think about some of the things in relation to, let's say, uh, you know, air travel, which is, uh, a, you know, an age old at this point, you know, kind of world. Talk about the relationship between, uh, as you say in the book, you know, it's, it's really still a product economy. 
mm-hmm. and, a, and, a, and a material economy, maybe not in the old Marxist sense, but still it's about you know, buying and selling things. That's different than just the information economy because I think there's something about the future being uh, you know, so uh, desired you know, in, in this way, and I think it also gives a, a, a reference point to, to films like Joe is making, which is what was the city and what's it gonna be like in the future or, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I'd just like to say it's, it's interesting for me to be here because um, you know, uh, critics of my book attacked it for its, its um, you know, uh, uncritical visions of, of inhumane megacities being built from scratch uh, on the edges of urban peripheries, and yet here we are in Century City. So, you know, I looked here and this looked very familiar. Not on the periphery, it looked, though. It looked, it looked very familiar and warm, homecoming to me. But, um, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned, like, Songdo, for example. Songdo is a fascinating, I, I think, city because, uh, you know, when, I, when I'm in parts of New York, even Battery Park City there, another sort of instant district of the city, it, it looks like Songdo today. Um, and, you know, and Songdo was in, is, is built for many reasons. And these cities in Asia that you refer to are being built uh, for all sorts of reasons. Songdo was designed not as a vision of the future. It was designed as a weapon for fighting trade wars. It was designed as a, as a piece of urban technology to fulfill an aim of the Korean government, which was to create a free trade zone that was appealing to Westerners to move there. Uh, so instead, they'd come to South Korea instead of Hong Kong or Singapore, which are the other sort of Asia-like met- you know, metropolises. Um, and, you know, and, and Songdo is interesting in the sense it was also meant to be their Silicon Valley. So, you know, South Korea, of course, got the future 10 years before we did here in the States, where they had, you know, they had broadband in the home, and you could watch every movie and television show ever made on demand, you know, by 2002. And so they saw Songdo as the place where they were going to move on to what they called new life, which we today, we call the Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything. Like my favorite, Cisco. You can't really go beyond the Internet of Everything. Let's we'll see if they can <laughs> hold on to the end run. Um, you know, and so it's, it's a sort of, you know, the, to me it's all interesting because the city itself is perceived as a technology. Keller Easterling at Yale has sort of made this connection as well. The, the city is itself is, is scaled up to a piece of infrastructure, a piece of technology, which you can use to solve a problem, that being trade wars or everything else. And then the question then becomes, what do you do with the city and how do you make it appealing? And, and in the case of Songdo, you know, it was designed to be a smart city where they were going to build sensors and everything and, you know, you'd, you know, you'd Famous vision, you would deposit your soda can and, and you would instantly be credited the recycling to your account, which of course means you know, you ha- it had to know that you know, that was you throwing the soda can away. It had to know your credit card information, all those other sorts of things that we might find a little terrifying. But I mean, when, and so, you know, and then only later, after they've had a hard time finding Western companies come there, do they add the sort of sustainable smart city, which is the second piece of this vision. I just find it fascinating that Songdo, they admit the fact that sustainability was a marketing concept for them. Um, and, but these are all, you know, these cities like this, like Mazdar, which is sort of the other sort of a, a smart, sustainable city of the Middle East, and these other examples, um, are all designed to be prototypes of the future. They're all designed, they're, they're marketable commodities. You know, the notion is you're going to build one, and then you're going to scale it across the world, and, uh, and it becomes the city as intellectual property, uh, in which case you own the mechanisms inside and then can license it out uh, willy-nilly. Um, and that all comes back to, I think, your notion of, you know, of materiality that you asked there, that something that the city itself you know, um, in the case of Songdo, an, an artificial island they built off the coast of Korea, uh, you know, the massive amounts of, of, of steel and concrete that has gone up, and I've got to watch it over the last six, seven years, uh, you know, go up in this place, is still, in the end, to them, uh, a piece of software. Um, that's literally how the American developer, Stan Gale, refers to it. And at one point, you know, he was trying to reverse engineer Songdo. I was, uh, I was talking to him in 2009 at, at the city's opening day, which, if you can, I highly recommend you go to a city's opening day where they literally cut ribbons and pretend it's all new. And, um, you know, and he was trying to get his architects to figure out the exact process they put the city together so they could reverse engineer it into steps and then start building them in mass across China. Uh, and they were going to build it. And Changsha was going to be the first one where they're now building the world's tallest building, uh, which will be hol- taller than the Burj Khalifa. And I think it's going to be built in two months. It's going to be all prefab assembled. <laughs> Um, and so that's the sort of notion of to defy materiality. You know, can we build the world's tallest skyscraper in two months? Can we reduce a city to its blueprints and scale it like an algorithm and do that? These are all the efforts uh, underway. And this to me is, you know, we could argue this is a terrible idea and dystopian and all that. But what, to me, it's fascinating. It's, it's being done. And it's, and it's seen by particularly governments and other large entities that can finance it um, as a brilliant idea because the world will be 80% urbanized, which means there's a tremendous business opportunity there. And as, as a final point to that, you know, I wrote a story on Paul Romer, the economist, um, who's trying to build cities from scratch in places like Honduras as a way to cure poverty. Um, he's attached to NYU's business school, Stern, where the dean literally told me that you know, just as you know, financialization was business school's point, which ended up ruining the world, they're almost halfway there, now they see their great mission as 
financing the infrastructure that will be built, that perhaps the great mission of the banking system going forward will be building cities. And so I, I leave you to shudder at that thought if they do <laughs> just as good a job. Hmm. Interesting. You know, uh, um, the, the idea of uh, the physical experience, the physical object in relation to um, you know, information economies is, is definitely a very strong tension. And, you know, Joe, you were at, at Columbia in the, in the late 90s, right? And that was three or four years after the first uh, paperless studio yep. kind of came online. Yep. Nin 90, 94, I think, you know, a few of us had computers. And, and uh, I remember the first graduates from, from Columbia, a number of them uh, who I taught, they came out to the West Coast because very few people knew how to animate and, you know, model digitally. And... I don't know if it's too much of an overstatement to kind of think that, you know, if you had been born 20 years earlier, you know, what your career would be because you were there at a particular moment where um, the medium of architecture for you obviously is incredibly fascinating, but you could see something on a kind of personal level about taking it into, you know, a purely digital world. And I remember, you know, just kind of being around that in the 90s when books like uh, Marc Auger's uh, uh, um, Nowhere? Non-Space. No, Non-Space, excuse yeah. me. The, the ethos and the feeling in the 90s was, you know, um, it's all going to disappear, and if a building's going to be made of anything other than glass, it's going to be a magic material that's even more transparent than glass. Um, air travel, uh, the, the sort of no one with a home, and no one owning objects. Now, my kind of crackpot theory is we go through that time, uh, digital technology affects everything, including architecture. And people like Frank Gehry and Herzog and everybody who's got commissions like to build Disney Hall or the Bird's Nest. Actually, digital technology start to reaffirm objects, especially in architecture. It starts to reaffirm icons like shit now we've got you know technology that can build this stuff or help us build it so why don't we push the nature of the material object you know even more we were even undaunted i think in 2008 when you know everybody became sort of sober again but i don't think that the kind of the loss of ambition for you know icons and and things that are you know sort of meaningful in cities even if we can navigate cities uh, with apps, we still want to go find the Statue of Liberty. We still want to go find and go to the top of uh, the Empire State Building and so forth. And uh, I, I think it's a, I think it's maybe something that we can we can chat with uh, the audience about. But I, for me, this is a special tension about being an architect. And maybe you can kind of talk a little bit about how how you took you know, the love and the fascination for architecture and basically said, I'm going to go do it in this way. Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think you're absolutely right. Had I gone, forget 20 years, if I had gotten, uh, gone to Columbia five years earlier, and I know people who did go to Columbia five years before me who say to me, oh, God, you got there just when they, because uh -huh. I still, you know, I still learned with vellum and T-squares and graphite, uh -huh. and you got all the cool stuff, and now... Look what you're doing with it, and look what I'm, you know, I'm stuck doing bathroom details. And uh -huh. um, so there, there was this sense of timing, certainly yeah. good timing. I got there uh, 96, <clears throat> and I was telling you earlier, it was a point where the paperless studios that you were teaching third year, to the third year students, mm -hmm. they were letting them start to kind of get access to this sexy software and computers like uh, right. uh, Alias and, and Maya. And, the first year, you know, they were trying to keep the first year students away from it. It was like, we literally like kids, you know, trying to like say, oh, we want to play with that stuff. And they're like, no, you're first year students, you need to learn how to draw. But we had this kind of swell, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and where we demanded to, you know, get access to the good stuff. And finally, the second semester, my first year, they opened the floodgates and it was all over then. Um, we were all over it. And, uh, and you know, it was, Photoshop and editing software and digital cameras and Maya and 3D Studio Max and and it was a really exciting time because it felt like we uh, we there was a specialness to software and hardware then 
because this stuff was so expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, the machines were $20,000, the software was $10,000. It wasn't like now where everyone, you know, you can, with Google SketchUp and stuff, you can do all that stuff for, for nothing. Um, but uh, so it, we felt privileged to have access to it, and I, and, and I, I just kind of um, dove into that world, uh, interning at architecture firms in the summers in between. And uh, by the time I graduated, I realized, uh, I, I looked, you know, I looked at the career of an architect and, and how difficult it was. <laughs> um, and then I looked at the kind of tools I had and what I could kind of make on my own mm -hmm. and, and, and realized I could kind of do, practice architecture in a, in a very different way. And you did some of the earliest animations, basically. Yeah, um, I mean, I was that were out there. Yeah, I did animation at the point where it, it was more like stop motion. It was like render an image, move it, render another one, move it, render it, and 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 so it was. It was like uh, Moybridge, you know, in a way. Right. Even though it was 1999, and uh, and I found, you know, a, a classmate of mine uh, and I, we formed this collaborative called KD Lab where we said we were going to explore the blurred boundaries between architecture, media, and film. Mm -hmm. And people thought that was ridiculous, <clears throat> you know, for, for some students to go out there and say that. And uh, But that's what we did. We, we, we played in that space and I found, um, for me, I just found that, you know, I was able to explore my interest in architecture but also storytelling with these tools and, and not only create these, um, these little films, uh, that was only half of it. The other half, as anyone who knows who works in the entertainment business, is getting your stuff seen. And the, 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 the internet, as the secondary part of that, the ability for me to take the little short film I made and put it online for everyone to see, um, was, the, was the kind of flip side of that coin that, that got noticed, someone saw it, called me up, and, and kind of, that's how I work, you know, sort of got into this job. Um, but yeah, certainly, Good timing uh, was, was a huge part of it. I mean, you sort of imagine that, uh, you know, thinking of, of uh, films like Total Recall and so forth, where um, and others where you could be in control of, um, you know, creating environments that are, you know, cheap and free and just like what's going on in Sim City, but doing it in an even more extreme environment. Because I remember seeing these these images and uh, these these renderings and animations and stuff and you know part of me was are you uh, am i looking at a, a a project for a movie or am i looking at an illustration of a of a place and you know the tension between that i think is is still there and also does it matter you know does it really matter you know for me a large part of the architectural experience is looking through books you know i mean i've certainly gotten to visit a lot of places but architecture is also a it's a it's a visual experience through you know the photography of ezra stoller or Jul julia schulman mm -hmm. for me that was a really inspirational thing so at the at the end of the day does it certainly there's there's something to be said for going to great architecture but mm -hmm. does it matter if if the place exists or not if you're looking at an image mm -hmm. i mean that was to me that was kind of interesting one one uh related question i remember hearing that Spielberg, when he made Minority Report, convened uh, Carl Sagan, Rem, and a couple of other people in a weekend to ask them one question, which is, what kind of city will I make? He knew it was going to be in Washington. Actually, Were you there or something? I, was not, like I just that? want to interrupt because this is the most amazing apocryphal story because that story is true, but I have never heard Carl Sagan and Rem, and everyone has a different group of futurists <laughs> who were there. So, <laughs> so it's literally like, who's the most futuristic person you could think of? They were there at the meeting. I love it. But yes. See? But you were right. Yes, it's a true story. Sorry. Finding out who was actually there. Yeah. And, you know, they had to decide, is it going to be a high-rise city with green around it, or is it going to be a horizontal city? In fact, you know, Washington, of course, no high-rises. and. And uh, when, you, when you sit down to, to you know, think about the film, and you've got a lot of things about uh, time frame, both sp specific, but also the way in which the art direction is going to you know, kind of play that out. When you're sitting down with you know, your designers and thinking about things, um, take us through a little bit just of a, of a conversation you're having about the way in which the visualization of industrial design, for instance, um, 
how smooth is it, how articulated is it, um, represents a particular type of futurism that on the one hand has to be tangible enough for us today. In other words, if we've got a, an iPhone, it, it, it gets us many steps into you know, the conversation. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, well, Oblivion actually, I did do something similar to this. It, didn't, it wasn't Carl Sagan at Room Cool House, but <laughs> I did, uh, on both films, uh, assembled a group of, you know, there's actually a, a foundation here in Los Angeles, uh, Science and Entertainment Exchange, uh -huh. um, where I was able to collect uh, 10 scientists from Caltech uh, and uh, JPL uh -huh. together into a room at the very beginning of the project and have my kind of super smart uh, brain trust there to uh -huh. take them through the story of the movie mm -hmm. and talk about all the conditions in the film and pick their brain with questions like, why would a, uh, an alien uh, race or an alien being, why would they come to Earth and what would they want? And you get to ask really smart people that. And it's very interesting. The answers surprise me. I mean, in the film, it's, uh, they come for deuterium, which is a real Thing. It's heavy hydrogen. It exists in seawater, uh, one part per you know cubic kilometer or something. I mean, it takes massive amounts to kind of extract it. But if you get enough of it, you can do kind of pure mm -hmm. uh, fusion. Um, but they said that's you could say that you know because that you need something physical for the plot of your film, and that's fine. But the real reason what makes us unique in the universe is rock and roll. Um, which I thought was interesting, you know, and, and kind of uplifting and exciting in a way that uh -huh. it's our creativity that really makes us different than any other uh, place in the universe. Um, so, you know, questions like that, uh, you know, hardware questions about, you know, the, the propulsion of the bubble ship, um, uh, you know, the, what would happen if you destroyed the, the moon, which is a big part of the movie. That's why the landscape looks the way it does is because the first thing they did was destroy the moon, which throws basically everything into chaos. Mm -hmm. um, so starting from a point of view of science was very useful. Uh, when it you know, comes to the kind of aesthetic choices, I mean, I, I tried to be as much of a kind of functionalist as possible, try to make everything, especially in science fiction, you, people know it's not real. Um, you need to make it feel as real as possible, like everything works. So what I did was like just try to I want everything to look like it actually functions and that takes mm -hmm. a lot of time and because and, you have to put in all the, that 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 extra level of detail um, uh, but um, you know I don't really know where it comes from that's the other thing you know who knows where these ideas come from but I, I know that's a part of the process that I love and uh, working with my designers to kind of figure out that language uh, for the film was was for me is one of the kind of most exciting parts. I, I think the, uh, the house um, with the choice to make, um, uh, you know, Victoria have the digital desk in front of her, but she's got a giant, you know, piece of glass mm -hmm. looking out physically, you know, like a, like a controller. Yeah. So the relationship between the eye and, and, you know, she's looking up and the reflections in her face and so forth. You know, on the one hand, you'd imagine another director not doing that. It'd be in a black box, right? There'd be no connection to the outside. I thought it was really fantastic to reaffirm, you know, reality in space, uh, you know, up there in 3,000 feet. So, very cool. Yeah, I mean, that for me, that was a big experience of the movie was what is it like, what would it be like to live in those conditions, you know, right. at 3,000 feet above the ground? And, right. you know, hopefully someone will, some Russian oligarch will build one of these things at some point so I can see it. So we've got about 15 or 20 minutes, and we'd love to uh, um, have a conversation if you've formulated some, some good questions right now. So please uh, chime in. We'd love to kind of take this to an ultimate extreme conclusion. There's one. Um, I saw the pictures of the future cities, and this is often how the future is p portrayed in um, movies but the cities have no trees, <laughs> and it, it always seems so soulless. And so I was curious about your thoughts about how you combine new technology, but what, kind of remembering where we came from, and connecting 
humans maybe not to what they think is shiny and new and what think they think they're going to make them happy, but what is actually going to make them happy and being feeling connected and feeling like they're part of a community and part of a like a home. Um, so it's it's not just about shiny and new. <laughs> I think that's a good point, and and you can you can feel that one with your, you know, uh, two worlds. Yeah, I mean. That's, that's right at the kind of heart of Oblivion. There is the, the main character, Jack Harper, played by Tom Cruise, has two homes in the movie. He has the Sky Tower, which Neil showed a picture of, which is as clean as clean can be, minimal. Um, and there's a reason for that. The, the, his living environment really represents the character's state of mind at the beginning of the film, which is a man whose memory has been wiped and I wanted the setting that he wakes up in to have that kind of artificial quality of a man who, whose memory only goes back three or four years. Um, what we find out in the film 20 minutes in is that Jack has a secret home as well that he hasn't told his uh, partner about, Victoria, and that is he's also built a cabin uh, by the lake down on the surface in the, kind of, uh, in a, in the middle of a crater that can't be seen. And in some ways, that is the complete opposite of the Sky Tower in every way. It's built by hand. It's in a grove of trees. It's next to a lake. It's cluttered with stuff he's collected from the surface, um, things that little things that he's been drawn to and picked up. He doesn't know why. We find out later why. But the, those kind of two extreme environments, to me, represent the, the state of mind uh, of the main character. Um, but I, I do agree, I mean, with what you're saying, that generally in science fiction, uh, future cities are, are pretty cold. And, um, and uh, I'm not sure why exactly that is. Maybe you know. Well, I, I think this gets to the notion of, I mean, we need to unpack what futurism means. I mean, futurism is sort of like modernism now. It's become its own trope and its own movement with our own expectations of it. So there's, a, there's an image that went around this spring, you know, during the peak of Beijing's smog breakout, where, you know, where pollution went off the charts. Um, it, was, it was, the caption of it was, Blade Runner is here, it's just not in Los Angeles. And it was an image of a massive video screen hawking Chinese uh, lipstick um, on this sort of curvy, wavy building, which is a real plaza in, in Beijing. Um, and the image it is, it could be a still from Blade Runner. And to me what's interesting is like, we still read that in 2013 in a real place as futuristic. Just like Jules Verne hangs out as futuristic, just like the tropes of 1950s you know, space hangs out as futuristic. Um, and so I, I just think it's interesting that we need to sort of unpack our notions of what we think the future will look like because I, I think particularly at the tra current trajectory of, of technology where Moore's Law is spinning much more ahead than our investment in physical you know, sort of infrastructure. The reason we have no, we have no uh, flying cars is because we have computers in our pockets that have all of the knowledge in the world at our fingertips. Uh, you know, sorry for the trade-off. Um, and so the, the question becomes, I think the, what the future looks like is the future is going to look much more like the, what's projected on your retina or what's over your Google Glass or something like this. I mean, you know, 25 years ago, we had a vision of the future that was cyberspace where you went into the computer. And now, even as William Gibson himself you know, has admitted that cyberspace is averting, now we're laying the internet onto our landscape. And so I think, you know, given the advances in computing power and given how we choose to make investments or not make investments, the fact that the United States cannot seem to spend anything on infrastructure under any circumstances uh, means that we're going to see Google start overlaying, uh, or, or someone, overlaying a new world on top of it. All those investments will be on projection. So I take issue to your, your uh, materiality comment. I think, I think we're becoming less and less in, interested in materiality because we're finding it so much harder to manipulate atoms than, than bits can be manipulated these days. We have another question here. Is this on? Thank you for doing the panel. Um, I'm a space architect, so I'm involved in future studies and designs all the time, and another, a whole bunch of ventures I'm involved with. I purposely do not have a cell phone or an iPhone. And the reason for that is I want my meetings and discussions to have genuine meaning, what you were talking about earlier. And I find that not having that enhances my and our team's creativity, because we have to be connected together. And that uh, is something I'd like to ask you guys about. How do you see technology and intelligence affecting creativity? Go ahead. Uh, well, 
I think it's I think it's a, a mix. I think it's a balance. It's trying. It's figuring out how to uh, use technology in a smart way, but it can like it can never be a replacement for uh, physical interaction. So, like I was saying, I've got we've got this app Pix, which is incredible because it works on my iPhone, it works on my iPad, it works on my desktop. Um, it's all linked together, and I can uh, get postings from visual effects companies, editorial. Um, writers, uh, it's interactive, we can all note it, uh, sound designers. Um, it's an amazing hub for people that are working in different areas to uh, immediately work on something and not wait for the meeting next Tuesday where you sit down and actually talk about it. Um, so I think, I think it can be, uh, as the uh, interface between digital technology and ourselves gets more sophisticated and you know, teleconferencing software gets better. Um, I think it can be really powerful, but I don't think it'll ever, you can never replace a face-to-face -face conversation. Um, I just don't think that's possible. Yeah. Well, Bill, Billy, I'm that, I mean, my, my, my equivalent to sort of your architecture school, uh, uh, you know, awakening experience was when I was in journalism school in the mid-90s. And uh, I remember arriving in, in 95 and marveling at the professors who used typewriters. Um, and today I do all my best work on legal pad. So, you know, I'm, I've become one of the Luddites that I despise. Um, and that's sort of equivalent to me. I need to be able to write at the speed at which I think and be able to interact with a medium that way, which I guess is sort of your, how you approach meetings that way. But to me, what's interesting about what you can do to apply intelligence, you know, the sort of smart city approach, smart intelligence to, you know, collaboration and who you meet, I think that's really interesting in the sense of, you know, that we have team sizes and we have organizations and we set boundaries around the corporation or around our teams and that's the only people we ever work with. And that and we don't necessarily know the smartest people in the room. And I'm particularly interested, as I mentioned earlier, in these ideas of, you know, how what happens is like the boundaries between organizations, the ones we work for and work with all the time, start to blur between all the other smart people in the city. So I'm interested in places like co-working where you can go work alongside strangers who are your peers, but you don't necessarily get the same paycheck from them. You can learn a lot from them in a very quick manner, you know, you were sitting side by side working with them even though you're not necessarily on the same projects. Um, and you know, and all sorts of other sort of environments you can do to sort of enhance uh, the speed and ability to connect to other people. And there's a role that technology has to play in that in terms of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think it's interesting we, since you bring up telepresence, I was literally debating this with, uh, with an executive of Steelcase, the, you know, the world's largest manufacturer of office furniture. They're making a very big bet into video collaboration. And I think the, the most interesting use of video will be you'll use video and you use that for low value meetings. The stuff that, you know, the, the, you'll, you'll go out into the world to meet people and discover new things. And then you'll have to report back to the office via over telepresence link because those are the dreary meetings you'd rather not be around in person for. Um, so that's that's my vision of it. If I had to do it, but I, yeah, I, I I second it. All the great ideas we're going to have are coming out of these rich encounters. Most of the time, we don't even know the contours. I mean, we know brainstorming doesn't work unless Jonah Lair was lying about that too. I think I think as long as um, there's choice in the world, and you articulated a choice, right? That technology isn't isn't quite often automatically paradigmatic. Is we we still consistently make choices and edit. The degree to which we'll allow ourselves or, or um, allow it to kind of change our lifestyle. Whether you have an addiction or, or a rejection of something or whether there's a dispassionate sort of just functionalist acceptance of something, you know that there's a whole range of emotions in there that make the sort of your, your, your worldview of what technology is is not consistently paradigmatic, you know, at one level. For anybody who rode a bicycle over here today says, I don't, I'm not into the paradigm of the car, whether it's a political one or something like that, right? Making choices, political statement or, or, or whatever it may be. Okay, I've got maybe a basic functional question, but as we hear about the world, the future, where we're reverse engineering cities and mass producing them across the globe, and they're beautiful and pretty and shiny and lots of people want to go there, what do we do with all the places that these people who are going there are abandoning? That's a great question, and it's twofold. Um, you know, so in, in the developing world, in places like China and India, I mean, what they're essentially doing is they're moving people out of the villages. So in China, for example, China has a plan to urbanize 400 million people in Western China over the next 20 years. And, and they have a legal instrument that we don't, which is that literally all they have to do is flip the switch, the hukou system, and you go from being rural to urban. And if you refuse, you just won't get any government services. You will have to go to cities if you want healthcare, education, anything else. 
Otherwise, they'll just deny your, visit your papers. Um, so China is making a concerted effort to move hundreds of millions of people out of the villages and letting it depopulate a bit um, and moving it into the cities. And India is doing something similar too. I mean, one of the urban projects they're doing is, is they're creating the Mumbai-Delhi Industrial Corridor. Uh, I believe it's 12 cities, 2 million people apiece, seven international airports, factories all along the route, uh, a mega urban development plan, which what I understand is exactly 20 people working on the master plan for it. Um, and Cisco and IBM are stepping in to help them do the, uh, the IT planning to make these smart cities. Um, and so, you know, uh, many of these places will be left to be abandoned to villages. In the United States, we have the opposite problem, and the, and the Brookings Institution just put out a report on this. Um, the triumph of the city, you know, the, the argument of all of us is who, are, who are dense, walkable urbanists at heart, um, is led to the failure of the suburb. And, you know, they put out a report on the suburbanization of poverty, and we've seen apparently the suburbanization of poverty has, has soared 200% in the last decade. The financial crisis has, has essentially uh, destroyed the suburbs and the financial model of it, and it's pushed ethnic minorities and immigrants out into suburbia. So we've now, you know, we've undone what happened in the 1950s and 60s, but now we've pushed the poorest into the places that are going to essentially, you know, depreciate the fastest, that are the hardest to deliver services to, um, that are, you know, the most geographically dispersed where there's the least amount of work. And so, you know, the dystopian environment, the future we find ourselves is one where we live in the great, shiny, beautiful, walkable city. Uh, those of us who can afford it and those who can't are pushed out to the edges. I actually had the wonderful experience, by the way, of, of meeting with the deputy, former deputy mayor uh, of New York, uh, Dan Doktoroff, who, uh, who's now the president of Bloomberg LP, who told me to my face that I have no God-given right to live in that neighborhood in Brooklyn uh, because the trickle-down effect of wealth and cascade and pushes all that further. Um, so that's what's going to happen in those places. I, the, what'll happen in those places, I'll end up moving there because I won't be able to afford where I live now. Well, uh, you guys have been a great uh, audience. Thank you so much for coming out. Please um, come out to the next couple of uh, events and to Runway in, in uh, the end of uh, June. So thank you so much.